Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is the series for April, May, and June of 2015. It's a very interesting series on the Gospel of Luke. You know, Luke was the third of those four Gospels in the, in the New Testament. And this is lesson number three in that series for April 18 of 2015. I hope you have your Bible handy because I want to make sure that when we quote from there, you believe that what we're saying because it's genuine and so forth. Now, we may, we may, not, be, may not be quoting from the version you have in front of you, but I think you'll recognize the slightly different translations when we read from them. Right now, let's bow our heads and ask God to guide us in our study together. A kind and wonderful Father, we have a question for you now. Who was Jesus Christ? This is, of course, a very pertinent question, a very important question in Christianity and a question that we want to focus on in our study together today. Help us to understand what you want us to know, to incorporate it into our thinking and our paradigm so that we will not make mistakes in the future with regard to it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The question, who is Jesus Christ, must be answered by every human being living on planet Earth in one way or another. A lot of people will answer that question by refusing to think about it. They just choose to ignore it. But that's an answer of kind, certain kinds. A lot of other people will argue about it. They go back and forth. Um, and we know that People have said marvelous things about Jesus, all kinds of wonderful things, even people who are not Christians. And I, and I quote from our Bible study guide, people can admire the works of Jesus, honor his words, extol his patience, advocate his nonviolence, acclaim his decisiveness, praise his selflessness, and stand speechless at the cruel end of his life. Many may even be ready to ac accept Jesus as a good man who tried to set things right to infuse fairness where there was injustice, to offer healing where there was sickness, and to bring comfort where there was only misery. You'll find that in the section for Sabbath afternoon of April 11. Anyone who reads the Gospels must have questions raised in his mind. Jesus is described as the Son of Man and also as the Son of God. Could a real, live human being living on planet Earth, be fully God and fully man at the same time? Now, all of you can just give me the perfect answer to that right now, just in a couple of sentences, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're listening. Yeah. Well, look at Jesus' own experience found in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. And I'm going to read most of that. It'll take a moment or two. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures. Now, what's a synagogue, just for those who may not be familiar with it? Jewish church. That's the place where the Jews went to worship on Sabbath, right? He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, this is very significant for us in terms of understanding Jesus' education and so forth. What does this tell us about Jesus' education? He could read. Well, not just that. <laughs> He'd been exposed to the scriptures. What was his native language? Native language is Aramaic. 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 He could read the Hebrew. And he worked at a city just a couple miles from Sepphoris, where there all the Roman, huge Roman camp was. So you know that he could speak Latin. You're sure he could speak Latin. And here he is looking through scroll and he's reading Hebrew. Jesus could speak and read at least three languages. Okay? That's what this verse tells us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. 
Now what's happening here? Does this mean the sermon is over? The reading of scripture is over. He's now going to discuss it. Okay. In, in Jewish normal operations in synagogues, someone stands up, is handed the scroll, reads the passage, he rolls it back up, hands it to the person who, who cares for the scriptures, sits down, and gives his discussion of what the scripture is about. That's the way it was normally done. So that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed on him. Why do you suppose they were so concerned, so interested in what he had to say? See what he was going to do. Yeah. And how many of them knew him? Quite a few, wasn't it? Probably everyone. I mean, this was his hometown. He's been gone for a while. He's been performing miracles. He stirred up everything down in the south. He, all of Jerusalem is in a stir because of him. And now he's back in his small hometown, and they're saying, wow, what's going to happen next? What do you think he's going to do? Right? If they didn't personally know him, they knew his reputation. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure they knew him personally, unless there were some visitors. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they were waiting for some fireworks. Yes. So he said to them, this passage of Scripture has come true today as you heard it re being read. Now, what was their understanding of that passage of Scripture? Their understanding was the next line which in Isaiah 61 says, and defeat their enemies. Yes, that's what they wanted to hear. He didn't read that. But what, well, be, and partly, mainly because, I guess, of that passage, what, what did they think these two verses from the Old Testament re was referring to? The Messiah. The Messiah. Yeah, the this was going to be the, one of the fulfill, one of the, prof the uh, prophecies of the Messiah. And so when Jesus is saying what? fulfilled in your ears. Meaning? For them it was I'm the Messiah. I am the Messiah. They were all well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words he spoke. They said, isn't he the son of Joseph? In other words, we, we here in the Nazareth, we have the Messiah right here with us. Right? He said to them, I am sure that you will quote this proverb to me, Doctor, heal thyself. That was a famous thing from, a, I believe, a, a Latin source, or maybe it was a Greek source, talking about do something right here. You will also tell me to do here in my hometown the same things you heard were done in Capernaum. Hmm. In other words, show us, God. I tell you this, you know, what, what is it that the movies famous movie said or recently it was show me the money so isn't it something like that I don't watch movies basically but I think it was, somebody said show me the money so that's what they're saying here right I tell you this Jesus added prophets are never welcomed in their hometown but he didn't stop there listen to me it is true that there were many widows in Israel during the time of Elijah when there was no rain for three and a half years and a severe famine spread throughout the whole land and they all knew this story very well Yet Elijah was not sent to anyone in Israel, but only to a widow living in Zarephath in the territory of Sidon. Did they know that story? Yep. Did they know every detail of that story? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And there were many people suffering from the dreaded skin disease who lived in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha. Yet none of them was healed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Did they know that story? Absolutely. Did they know every detail of that story? Yes. When the people of the synagogue heard this, they were filled with anger. Because he quoted the Old Testament that they already knew about? What was the problem? They rose up, dragged Jesus out of the town, took him to the top of the hill on which their town was built. They meant to throw him over the cliff, but he walked through the middle of the crowd and went his way. And a year and a half ago, I had the privilege of standing on that cliff. I have pictures of it. And you could sure enough throw somebody down. What was the problem? Why did they have such a problem with what he was doing, what he was saying, what he was doing? It wasn't what they were expecting. And they well, think about it. If you believe that salvation was going to come only to the descendants of Abraham, how could you have God preferring a Gentile to a Jew? Impossible. 
So either their paradigm was right, wrong or this data is wrong. So it's easier to get rid of Jesus than to change the way we think. I wonder if that can have any implications for us in our day. Wasn't some of that blasphemy, though, what in their view? Well, of course it was. Yeah, major because it didn't agree with their teaching, exactly. what they believed. They could not accept the idea that Jesus might have preferred a Gentile over a Jew. Incredible. Well, look at Luke 7, chapter 7, verses 17 to 23. This news about Jesus went through all the country and the surrounding territory. When John's disciples told him about all these things, he, this is, Jesus is now near the end of his Galilean ministry. John is in prison at Machairus. And so when John hears about this, he sends two of them, his disciples to the Lord to ask him, are you the one John was, said was going to come or should we expect someone else? I thought John had already proclaimed him to be the Lamb of God. Twice, in fact. What's the problem here? I think John's thinking was, I am here in prison, suffering. Mm -hmm. If Jesus really is the Messiah, why am I here? He yeah. should have me out there helping him. Exactly. And not only that, what's Jesus supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be delivering us from the Romans, right? He could at least start by getting me out of prison, right? <laughs> so we're yeah. saying that even, you're saying that even... John the Baptist, who was preparing the way for Jesus, had a wrong picture. And you can read about that in Desire of Ages. He could not understand why Jesus did not find some way to get him out of prison. So he sent these two disciples. And, and what did Jesus do when these two disciples came to him? Did he say, get out of here. You guys, you know, you know the truth. Why are you bothering me? What did Jesus do? He said, go and tell John what you've seen. They, Jesus didn't, didn't answer. He just kept on doing what he was doing. Watch. And all day long he's preaching and he's healing and he's raising people from the dead, etc., etc. And the disciples are, I mean, I hope their eyes were this big. They were watching everything very carefully. And finally Jesus said, what? Go and tell John what you have seen. Meaning that faith, trust in God is supposed to be based on Evidence. It's not a leap in the dark. Faith is supposed to be based on solid evidence. It's not even a claim from nope. somebody's mouth, even the authority. Well, how do you suppose John responded when they came back to him? What would you have said to John if you were one of those messengers? I am sure they detailed him exactly everything they saw that day. And how do you think John responded? You must increase, I must decrease. Well, John said, there's no question. I'm sure he said, there's no question. He is the one. Well, what's implied by the but name? What convinced him? The words of Jesus, his teachings, or his miracles? Yes. <laughs> I think both. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. What is the meaning of son of man? Son of man. <laughs> Christ huh? used it to identify himself with humanity. That was the most common term he used for himself. Yeah. And it implies, first and foremost, that he is descended <clears throat> from the human race. Was he? Was he not born of Mary? Yeah, yeah he, was a, he was a human being. But he was also God. And, um, well, we're, we're, I guess we can take time for another couple more verses. Look at Luke 1, 31 and 32. You will become, this is the angel speaking to Mary, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Of course, the original Aramaic and Hebrew was Yeshua or Joshua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord God will make him a king and his, as his ancestor David was and he will be the king of the descendants of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Couple of look, look also at chapter 2 verse 11. This very day in David's town, this is now 
the angel speaking to the shepherds, uh, your Savior was born Christ the Lord. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew Messiah. Messiah, Messiah or Mashiach. But to Mary in vision, he's called the Son of the Messiah. Aren't all human beings children of our Heavenly Father? Don't we claim to be children of God? So what was different about his humanity from ours? Was he, the question of course is, was he fully human? Yes. Well, don't hesitate yes. a second, yes. you're <laughs> worrying me here. The answer is yes, absolutely he was human. Okay? And the New Testament makes it very clear. Jesus himself repeatedly said, calls himself the Son of Man. I've never seen a human being born of a virgin, though. That's exactly Luke's point. He said he was born of a, a human being to ma and, and born in a, in a manger. I mean, he was born in a stable and laid in a manger, a, a, a trough feeding trough for animals to show that he was human. But he was born of a virgin to show that he was God. You sure that will show you th that he's a human? You tell me what? Are you sure that that would show you that he was human? If you being saw him, born, if you saw him being, being born, born of a virgin, what human? No, no. Being born of a virgin proves that he's God. It doesn't prove that he's human. It being being his circumstances of birth. I mean, he you know he came out of Mary. Yeah. That makes him a human being. Human being yeah. And the circumstances. He wasn't... Well, my he, point is... He, was, he didn't descend seen, in a cloud or something like that. I've never seen a human being being born from a virgin. No. I've never even known of anybody like exactly. that. Exactly. So is that, is that going to be proof that he's a human? Just no, that's going to be a proof that he's God. Yeah, but is it going to be a proof that he's human? Well, if you see him come out of that virgin, he's human. Human, all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a unique situation. It it's a very like unusual, it. a totally unique situation. The DNA from the, from the God or the Father or Spirit mm -hmm. and uh, the DNA from Mary. Jesus says, my Father, which is in heaven, as reminding his disciples that while his humanity is, he is while by his humanity he is linked with them, a sharer in their trials and sympathizing with them and their sufferings. By his divinity, he is connected with the throne of the infinite. Desire of Ages, page 442, paragraph 3. So why did God leave the joy, peace, and comfort of heaven to become a human being, especially a helpless baby boy? Don't. I mean, you could see him coming down maybe like Adam was born. He comes down as a human being, full of adult, ready to take on the battles of life. But God descending to become a baby boy, a totally helpless baby boy? Ultimately to bring joy to the human race as well as to reveal the truth about uh, God. And one more thing. To be an example for us. There's nothing that we have to go through that he didn't go through. Well, the term Son of Man is applied to Jesus more than 80 times in the Gospels. 25 of those occurrences are here in Luke. He's also called the Son of Man back in Daniel 7, verse 13. Let's look at that for a second. Daniel 7. If you read earlier, I don't have time to read the whole story in Daniel 7, but it talks about the court setting up in heaven. And the Father comes down with his white robes and sitting on the thro throne of fire, etc., and the millions and millions of angels gathered around. And s during this vision, verse 13, during this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. In, in the King James, it looked like a son of man. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. Who do you think that's talking about? Christ. You don't have to guess. Yeah, for sure. He's also called the Son of Man in Acts 7, verse 56 in, in Stephen's speech, and also in Revelation 1, verse 13 and 14, verse 14. Jesus has chosen to identify himself forever with the human race, as noted in these words from our Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, April 14. The humanity of the Son of God, now this is actually quoted from Ellen White, 
the humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humanity in becoming a man, yet he was God in the flesh. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 244. The use of Son of Man in Luke provides various insights into the nature, mission, and destiny of the incarnate Jesus. First, the title identifies him as a human being, Luke 7, 34, with no worldly address or, sec or security, Luke 9, 58. Second, Luke uses the title to assert Christ's divine nature and status, for the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath, Luke 6, 5. Therefore, he is also the creator with the power to forgive sins, Luke 5, 24. I mean, look at all these references. I mean, if we had time, we'd look at each one of these verses and analyze them. Third, to accomplish this redemptive mission, ordained by the Godhead before the foundations of the world, Ephesians 1, 3-5, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, Luke 9, 56 and 19, 10. But the redemption itself cannot be completed until the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and be killed and be raised the third day, Luke 9, 22. This self-awareness of the Son of Man, what does she mean by the self-awareness? Or what does our Bible study guide mean by its self-awareness? He knew what his mission was. Yes. He knew what his mission was and he knew exactly where it was going to take him, didn't he? Yeah. 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 He wasn't surprised. This self-awareness of the Son of Man about the path he had to tread and the price he had to pay for the redemption of humankind for sin reveals not only the divine origin of the plan of redemption, but also Christ's submission in his humanity to that plan. Fourth, note how complete a picture of the suffering Messiah that Luke portrays in the following passages. His foreknowledge of the cross, Luke 18, 31 to 33. I love this passage. Let me take just a moment and look at that. This is the fourth time that Jesus has spoken to his disciples, even though my Bible says third time. If you look very carefully and you compare all the Gospels, it's actually the fourth time. At least it looks like it to me. Jesus took the, now they're on the road. They've traveled from Galilee down along Perea, and Jesus has joined a huge caravan of people that are on their way up to Jerusalem for the Passover. And this is the time when he's going to be crucified and killed. And they're on their way up from Jericho to Jerusalem. And Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. Is that hard to understand? Who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Is any, any, are any of those words hard to understand? No. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Now, I know this isn't commonly experienced, but is, are those words hard to understand? Well, what's, what's really strange is he's talking in the second person. Well, he says, the Son of Man, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what he did about yeah. the Holy Spirit yeah. also. Mm -hmm. so, well, but the interesting thing to me is the next verse. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. And there's nothing there or any else in the gospel that explains that Jesus is going to, what the efficacy of his death was going to do. Mm -hmm. He explained that he's going to, they're going to kill him, but then he explained what, what is it going to accomplish yeah. and what the message was uh, to be. He just says, this is going to happen, but didn't uh, expound on it. And there's, there's nothing there in the you, gospel. You have, to, you have to figure it out for yourself. After it's all happened. After you see the whole thing. It, it fort, foretell, there's in, nothing in the foretelling uh, what, where he was foretelling, it didn't say what the conclusion is be or the lesson you're going to get out of it. But our lesson here says his foreknowledge of the cross, the passage I just read, his betrayal, Luke 9:44, his death as a fulfillment of prophecy, Luke 22:22, 22, 22, his crucifixion and resurrection, Luke 22:4. Um, I'm sorry, Luke 24:7 compare with Luke 11:30 and his role as the mediator before the Father Luke 12 verse 8 fifth Luke sees the son of man in the last day terms as the one who returns to earth to reward his saints 
and to wrap up the great controversy, and there's a whole bunch of passages there, Luke 9, 26, 12, 4, 17, 24, 26, 30, 21, verse 36, and 22, verse 69. In short, the title Son of Man incorporates the multifaceted aspect not only of who Christ was, but what he came to do and what he has accomplished and will accomplish for us in the plan of salvation. He came to be a part of us, to save us. Well, both Luke, Matthew, and Mark all talk about um, these final day events. Let, let me just, let me read the one from Mark. Mark 8, 27. Then Jesus and his disciples went away to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, tell me who do people say I am? Now what do we know about Caesarea Philippi? Anybody? <coughs> okay, remember that it's gotten to the place near the end of Jesus' ministry that there's a death warrant out for him. Anybody who can should arrest him, either in Judea or in Galilee. So he takes his disciples. He said, we need to get out of here and let things cool off for a little bit. He goes up to Tyre and Sidon, and that's where he met the woman with the demon-possessed daughter. He goes from there over to Caesarea Philippi, on the other side, well, at the basic up near the headwaters of the Jordan River. And what was, and this is now Philip's headquarters, Herod Philip's headquarters. And there's, even if you can visit there, even today, there are still pieces of temples of all kinds of pagan gods there and so forth. And Jesus says, okay, you've been with me for quite a long time now. Here's all these temples to pagan gods. How do, how, do, how do I fit into this picture? Well, tell me who do people say I am? That's his first question. Some say that you are John the Baptist, they answered. And why would they say that? He seems to be carrying on the message of John the Baptist, doesn't he? Who had been killed. Who had been killed. Others say that you are Elijah. Why would they say that? Malachi. Yeah. That's what it says he's going he's to come back in oh. Malachi. Um, others say that you're one of the prophets. Moses said someone's going to come like me. Jeremiah seems to imply that maybe someone's going to come like him. What about you, he asked them. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And in Matthew it says the son of the living God. Then Jesus ordered them, do not tell anyone about me. Why would Jesus say that? Probably didn't want to set, uh, get the others, the authorities, uh, chasing after him right, so soon. They were already after him. Oh. They were already after him. There's a very specific reason. If these disciples at this point in time said, he's the Messiah, even in their minds, what was the Messiah supposed to do? Get rid of the Romans. Organize a military or whatever and get rid of the Romans. They would have totally misrepresented the mission of Christ if they'd gone around telling people, here's the Messiah, we have the Messiah. They would have completely misrepresented his mission. So to us, it would have been logical to say, here's the Messiah, but yeah. to them, it, convey, it would convey the wrong idea. They would have had a completely different idea about what that meant. Well, didn't the disciples have a different idea anyway? Well, up until the point where he was crucified and rose from the dead, yeah. Yeah, so... But so that's why he's saying, like don't, don't go around telling people that I'm the Messiah because they're going to start asking questions and you're going to give the wrong answers also, because your understanding is wrong. When he did some healings, didn't he tell them not to tell them who did this? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Same reason. And when you t tell somebody, not don't tell, <laughs> somebody's got to tell. you got to exactly. tell somebody. Yeah, it, it really encourages people to say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, they say tell well, them. I, they had traveled Tyre and Sidon. They went around to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is full of Roman gods, Greek gods, pagan gods of various kinds. Uh, there they were. And Jesus said, okay, look at these temples here. Look at all this finery, all this gold and jewels and fancy temples and so forth. Who am I? Well, Jesus had recently rec revealed his authority over nature, Luke 8, to 25, his power over demons, 
Luke 8, 26 to 35, his might over disease, Luke 5, 12. We know these stories, but I'm just mentioning them. Luke 5, 12 to 15, 8, 43 to 48. Even his ability to feed about 20,000 people he's only, using only five tiny loaves and two fish, Luke 9, 13 to 17. He had even demonstrated his power over death itself, Luke 8, 51 to 56. So he had done all those things, and now he's asking his disciple what question? Who do you say I am? Okay? You know what I've done. You were there for all those occasions. And I quote, this is from uh, a quotation from William Barclay's commentary. Our knowledge of Jesus must never be secondhand. We might know every verdict ever passed on Jesus. We might know every Christology that, and Christology means study about Jesus and learning about him, that human minds have ever thought out. We might be able to give a competent summary of the teaching about Jesus of every great thinker and theologian and still not be Christians. Christianity never consists in knowing about Jesus. It always consists in knowing Jesus. Jesus Christ demands a personal verdict. He did not ask only Peter, he asked every one of us, you, what do you think of me? Well, read all three counts of the Transfiguration as recorded in Luke 9, 27 to 36, Matthew 17, 1 to 9, and Mark 9, 2 to 8. We don't have time for that right now, but let's review the story very quickly. What happened? Jesus left most of his disciples behind. He's on the eastern side of, the Ga of Galilee. He's about to climb a fairly significant mountain. He calls Peter, James, and John to go with him. And they're to toiling their way up. They've been walking all day, probably preaching and healing. They're tired. And Jesus sets them off to climb this mountain. And they get up. They get somewhere near the top. We don't know if they were at the exact completely top, but near the top anyway. And what does Jesus tell them to do? Let's pray. And they prayed for him, with him for a while, Ellen White says, and pretty soon what are they doing? Sleep. Yeah. And Jesus is still praying, and all of a sudden they're awakened by what? A bright light. You could just imagine, you know. And what do they see? Two figures. Jesus plus Moses and Elijah. Who does Moses represent? Those who have died. And Those who have died and will be resurrected at the second coming. Who does Elijah represent? Translated. Those who will be translated who never tasted death, because that's what happened to him. Okay? Yes? How did they know this was Moses and Elijah? The, the only way they could have known is someone told them. Either, an angel either a voice, them. an angel from heaven, God's voice from heaven, Jesus maybe. Or maybe they introduced themselves. Or introduced themselves, yeah. That's the only way they could have known. Now, to our Christian friends, they wouldn't find this surprising at all because they think that everybody goes to heaven when, they're, when they die. But, of course, Elijah didn't die. We know how he got to heaven. How do we know about G Moses getting to heaven? Deuteronomy. No, that was... a. Uh because Moses' jo Jude? assistant wrote it. R what did he say? Well, it's interesting. In the assistant talks about... Maybe we should just look at that for a second real quick. Deuteronomy. Look at the very end of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 34. And Jude 9. Oh, you're cheating now. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Mount Pisgah and so forth. What and verse? I'm, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with verse 5. I'm skipping down. So Moses, his Lord's servant, died there in the land of, the Lo of Moab as the Lord had said he would. The Lord buried him in a valley of Moab opposite the town of Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows the exact place of his burial. So who buried him? The Lord. Yahweh. The Lord. the Lord. Yahweh buried him. Yahweh. Moses was 120 years old, da-da-da-da. And then it says, 
Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with wisdom because Moses had appointed him to be his successor, and so forth and so forth. And it talks about there has never been a prophet in Israel like Moses. The Lord spake, spoke with him face to face. No other prophet has ever done miracles and wonders like those that the Lord sent Moses to perform against the king of Egypt, his officials, and the entire country. No other prophet has been able to do the great, terrifying things that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And where is Moses still? In the grave. He's in the grave. There's nothing here about Jesus, about Moses going to heaven. Where do we find that? Jude 9. Okay. You want to read that to us? You got it there handy? But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Okay. So this is a story about, and why would the devil be fighting with God over the body of Moses? Well, he was, Moses was still in the grave, and that's the devil's territory. Okay, exactly. So the devil is saying, this man's died, he's, he's buried, he is mine. Yep. And what does God do? Wrong again. <laughs> Wrong again. <laughs> Wrong again. Step aside, I'm taking him. I'm Proving that he has the right to do what? Raise people from the dead. The power of life and death. The it power is. over life and death. Very important point. So here they are on the top of the mountain. Jesus is talking to them, and Peter, of course, he's always want to do something, then wants to speak up. Let's make three tents here for you. And then suddenly there's a cloud of glory. They can't see him anymore, and they fall face down on the ground, and when they look up, the cloud's gone, and only Jesus is there. By the way, what did Jesus tell them on the way down the mountain? Do you remember? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. The famous phrase, don't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. Desi Desire of Ages, page 422, says these words. They believe, they believe, the, th the three disciples believe that Elijah has come to announce the Messiah's reign. What are they thinking? The Messiah is going to get, get us out of this Roman yoke. The it's disciples. It's, it's almost at the end of Jesus' ministry and that the kingdom of Christ is about to be set up on this earth. The disciples are confident that Moses and Elijah have been sent to protect their master and to establish his authority as king. Can you believe it? They were that misled at that point after spending all those years with Jesus personally. Is Jesus a lousy teacher or what? People are <laughs> <Yes>. stubborn students. <laughs> yeah. He has very difficult students. The hardest things we need to learn, we need to do to, to get a good education is to unlearn our wrong ideas and our wrong habits. It's harder to unlearn a bad thing than it is to learn a new thing. While Moses and Elijah have been chosen over any of the other angels in heaven, any of the angels in heaven, because they had suffered through various kinds of problems while living on this earth and could better provide solace and comfort to Jesus. So how are we supposed to relate to this question of the humanity and the divinity of Christ? Let me read you a couple more words. These are some more words from Ellen White. Avoid every question in relation to the humanity of Christ which is liable to be misunderstood. Truth lies close to the track of presumption. In treating upon the humanity of Christ, you need to guard strenuously every assertion lest your words be taken to mean more than they imply and thus you lose or dim the clear perception of his humanity as, compared, as combined with divinity. Sorry, His birth was a miracle of God. Never in any way leave the slightest impression upon human minds that a taint of or inclination to corruption rested upon Christ, or that he in any way yielded to corruption. He was tempted in all points like as man is tempted, yet he is called that holy thing. It is a mystery that is left unexplained to mortals that Christ could be tempted in all points like as we are and yet be without sin. The incarnation of Christ has ever been and will ever remain a mystery. It was a letter written to a friend in Australia in 1895 by Ellen White. Does that last sentence, the incarnation of Christ has never been and will ever remain a mystery? Does that mean including in heaven? 
in the What we're told is this, this question, this understanding, will be our study for the rest of eternity. That means we can't know everything there is about it or we wouldn't be bothering or wasting our time studying it. So I shouldn't be surprised that I don't know everything about it now. You might not need to be surprised. Does it really matter if we believe that Jesus was fully God? Yes. Yes. Why? If he's going to show us what God is like, he is God. Yeah. He needs to be If God. the questions in the great controversy are about God's character and government, which we firmly and absolutely believe, then the only one who can answer those questions completely and fully is God himself. So if Jesus was not fully God, we do not have the answers in the great controversy. In the great controversy between God and Satan over God's character and government, we cannot, there cannot be any doubt about the answers. If Jesus was not fully human, he could not be a full and complete example for us living on this earth. If someone asked you to prove from the Bible that Jesus was fully God, how would you respond? By the way he lived. Well, the things we've talked about, the fact that he was born of a virgin, some other things like that, and the response. The, the most convincing thing, is, especially as far as Satan is concerned, was at the end of his life, what happened? He came forth from the grave in his, from, from death in his own power. You absolutely cannot do that unless you're God. That was the, that was the final argument against Satan. There was nothing more for Satan to say after that. He can go on professing his nonsense, but the truth was out. Ellen White was asked that question one time, and she responded, was the human nature of the Son of Mary changed into the divine nature of the Son of God? No. The two natures were mysteriously blended in one person, the man, Jesus Christ. I was just reading here in Hebrews 2, 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Yes and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. Imagine Satan being through all the thousands of years afraid of dying. He's in a type of bondage yep. That's yep. of his own making, really. So how does Jesus destroy the devil? Oh, now, he true. could he could just manually grab him by the neck and destroy him, but how did he just actually destroy him? Did reveal the truth. Yeah. Re Show the falsehood of every one of his claims. He showed that Satan is a liar. Well, right there in John 8, the father of lies. If you completely discredit someone, you saw everything they claim is absolutely wrong. What? But there's still some that will hang on to those lies. Yeah. That's human nature. Once more from Desire of Ages, page 311. <clears throat> Jesus was in all things made like unto his brethren. He became flesh, even as we are. He was hungry and thirsty and weary. He was sustained by food and refreshed by sleep. He shared the lot of man, yet he was the blameless Son of God. He was God in the flesh. His character is to be ours. Wow. Wow. Okay, Sarve of Holly. Yes. Which of the Gospels is it that emphasizes that Jesus was hungry and thirsty and slept and so on? Was that John? Well, all of or them talk of about them? that some. I think probably the one who mostly, most does that is, it would be between Mark and Luke, are the ones who mostly do that. But how can you pray all night and then get up and do your work? We need to learn how to do that. Have you... Has anybody mastered it that you know of? Do any of my personal friends know? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe they're well, keeping it a secret from me. I wonder if... Well, never mind. Would you say that's <laughs> healthy as a physician, though? Well, what I, what I know is this. God knows more about my physiology than I will ever know. 
if, if he wants me to stay up all night and pray, and if I could learn how to do that in close affiliation with him, if I really knew, that, knew how to connect to him the way Jesus did, I would rise refreshed in the morning. Now that doesn't mean I should try to beat myself all up as a human being because I can't do that. But it does mean there's still more things I need to learn about my relationship to God. I can let you know as a physician that physicians not infrequently work all night after working all day the day before and they're so involved in what they do, maybe saving lives, etc., that they're invigorated. And I can believe that Jesus spent all night in prayer and they're ready to go s still the next day. Mm. Okay. Sarva Pali, Radha, and I can't pronounce his name correctly, I'm sure, Radha Krishnan, a former president of India and a noted philosopher, is reported to have said that Christians are ordinary people making extraordinary claims. One such claim is, that, is the assertion that Christ is verily God and verily man. What would have happened if Jesus had been a sinner when God's presence glorified him on the Mount of Transfiguration? It would have destroyed him. So, what does that show us? What does that teach us? Well, first of all, it didn't happen. It didn't happen, so... Um. So, so this means that on his <laughs> almost, well, it's still, it's still a few months before his crucifixion, but it shows that up to that point in time, he was still perfectly sinless. Similar to Isaiah 34? Yeah. Or 33, rather? 33, 33 14. 10, to six, 10 to 14, 10 to 16. Now, Peter, James, and John were there, mm -hmm. real close. Sleeping. Why weren't they consumed? Because they weren't, they weren't glorified. Jesus appeared suddenly. He, he was shining bright. They, ne they were never shining bright. They just were, they were sort of just in awe. In so awe. Why weren't they, they were looking consumed? on. What? So why weren't they consumed? Well, because God, God didn't actually be, you know, in, invade their bodies, if you will, or whatever. I mean, in other words, they didn't, turn, they didn't get turned into bright, bright shining oh, beings. Oh, I see where you're coming yeah, okay. okay. They saw it, but they didn't become bright shining beings. Yeah, they saw exactly. Bright shining. They just watched. They just saw it. In writing his gospel, G Luke called Jesus the Son of the Highest, the Holy One, and the Son of God, Luke 1, 33 to 31 to 35. Jesus is called the Son of God because, and again I quote from Ellen White, Christ was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. <coughs> Daniel 7, Jesus appeared as the majesty of heaven. We looked at that, but is called the Son of Man. In Luke 9, 58, he has said about himself that he had nowhere to lay his head. What do these two contrasting comments teach us about himself? How can you say, here is someone who is fully God, and yet he doesn't have a place to lay his head. I mean, it's like saying, why is the king of the universe being born in a feeding trough? Right? So in answer to our original question in this lesson, God is waiting for completely honest and heart-searching answers to this question in each one of us. Do we really believe that Christ was essentially God? And in the highest sense, he was with God for all, from all eternity, God over all, blessed forevermore. The Lord Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, existed from eternity, a distinct person, yet one with the Father. He was the surpassing glory of heaven. He was the commander of the heavenly intelligences. Now, Jim earlier mentioned the passage about the Holy Spirit that walking through the grounds down at Avondale. So Ellen White clearly believed that there were three distinct persons involved in the Godhead. You think so? That's, what I, that's the way I read that these passages. The Avondale thing, I think, is he, she's just saying that, look, it, God, the Holy Spirit is here just like He's right here. Mm -hmm. That's why he said, she said, he's walking. Right. That's the way I, I okay, saw that's it. That's fine. Right. 
But that's right. not the part we're talking about. What, he, what does she say next? He is as much a person as God is a person. Well, I have no problem with that. Okay. That, because they're the same person. Well, but that's not what it says. <laughs> that's what it means. No, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. I don't, I, I don't think it means that. When we want a deep problem to study, let us fix our minds on the most marvelous thing that ever took place in earth or in heaven, the incarnation of the Son of God. Okay. In Desire of Ages, you remember she said, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour every day thinking about the life of Christ, especially what? The closing scenes. What do you suppose would happen to us if we did that? Well, I'd, one thing I think we need to be sure, though, that we need to put it in the context of his whole life. Because sure. like Paul says in Rome, or, or Romans 5, 10, we are reconciled by his death, but we are healed or saved by his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got to get the whole, whole... And Jesus said before he died, he says, know the Father and the Son, that's it, that is eternal life. So I think it's... Uh, John 17. Yes, John 17, 3. So it's, it's very important that uh, we, these... So what does John 17, 3 see? Let's Because you, you mentioned something very important. Let's expand on it a little bit. John 17, 3 says, This is life eternal to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I'm reading, I'm now quoting from the King James. And then he, verse 4, he says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't died yet. Yeah, so, exactly. it, it, so he's saying to us, and, and really as a part of summary of this lesson, if we really understand, at least as far as we're capable of understanding, the humanity of Christ and the divinity of Christ and get to know God, because this is, this is the only way we have of knowing God. We look to Jesus. Well, we have the stories from the Old Testament and so forth, but in far, as far as really experiencing or seeing God, this is our opportunity to know and see God. And to do that, it changes our thinking, and yeah. that thinking is well, how we do the knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, he humbled himself. Well, let's see, I'm sorry here. God gave his son to die for sinful human beings, a death of ignominy and, sh ignominy and shame, and we know about that. He humbled himself to suffer with the race, to be afflicted in all their afflictions. In fact, what can we say about the humanity of Jesus Christ? He suffered. Well, no, yes, that's true, and there's no question about that, but the, even more than that, he has joined the human race for the rest of eternity. Right. He will remain, and what does that mean? What does it mean to say he's joined the human race for the rest of eternity? Can we know? And linked. What? He's connected and linked. He left and his linked. capacity to, uh, that he had in heaven to live uh, with the human race for eternity. Okay. We call, what he lost in this experience was his omnipresence. And that was a price he paid. Yeah, that was a price he paid to be linked to us. Now, in the future, he's going to be living here, the heaven finally after the thousand years of millennium, the hev heaven is going to descend to this earth, right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, this is going to be their headquarters. And Jesus will continually maintain his human appearance. We don't know exactly what all that means, but he will still apparently have scars visible in his hands. Why would that be necessary? In, in our light of our lesson today, why would that be necessary? It's kind of like a signature. Okay, signature of what? Signature of what happened. Okay, so in, Jesus is saying, what I accomplished through the history of humanity here on this earth, from beginning, from the Garden of Eden to the final act at the, at the third coming, what, a, what is accomplished by that whole mission is my signature the fact, well, the plan of salvation, if you will, of why my way of running the universe is the only viable way of running the universe, and the fact that I want as many as possible of my children to be a part of it. He wants us to be, in fact, I, I think God actually plans for us to be his ambassadors for the rest of eternity. 
He's going to say to you and to me, I'd like you to go out there. I've just created a new world out there somewhere with new beings. I want you to go out there and tell them about the plan of salvation. Can you imagine a mission like that? Well, the final question in our lesson for today is, have you resolved in your own mind this fully God and fully man? And I, I guess from questions and the comments that have been made here that the answer is we haven't. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, how does it affect, how is it supposed to affect us personally? Thought about that? We're supposed to be able to see God. Okay. Through Him. Okay. That's what it's for. And He wants to reproduce Himself in us. Mm-hmm. And what's supposed to happen as a result of that? Matthew 5, verse 16. Do you remember what it says over there? Matthew 5, verse 16. We all should know like that light verse. So shine. Okay. But nobody will be self-centered. Nobody will be self-centered. And my version, my Good News Bible says, In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and... Praise your Father in heaven. Well, my RSV says that glorify, um, glorify, uh, and give glory to your Father. And the and the uh, uh, Revelation twenty one, the glory of God is the light of the new Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. exactly. So we are supposed to be we are supposed to be lights to the world. That's us. Are we doing it? You and your community out there, are you being a light to your surroundings? Is it possible for you to be a light? Some of you I know live in, under very difficult circumstances. We are very comfortable here in Loma Linda. We don't have any big problems. We can speak about Christianity freely. We don't know about where you are and what difficulties you face. We'd love to hear from you if you get an opportunity to send us an email at info at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. We would love to hear from you. We'd like to hear if you have questions about this really major issue. Was Jesus fully God? Was he fully man? And don't think that we're going to give you all the answers back because we don't have them either. It's a question, a struggle, a, a discussion that will go on for the rest of eternity. And I'm hoping Jesus is the one who's going to lead that discussion. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these lessons. We thank you for all they have taught us, for the depth that they, we have just begun to touch on. May we learn to be more like you. May we learn from you. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.